Um, let me kind of show you the, what I did uh, on Monday. Um, you can sort of see the technique. So the, the first step here is actually to just use a, a block. So there's many options how to do it. Um, we're lucky at our, at our, at our surgery center, um, the anesthesiologists are amazing. They do the blocks for us. And they actually don't do retrobulbar blocks. They do actually a peribulbar block, which works phenomenally. So don't be scared of always needing retrobulbar. You can if you want to. If you're comfortable doing it, fine. That's OK. Um, I myself, when I do a block, I'm not aiming to go getting the second pop of tissue to tenons. I just kind of put the needle up to its base, and wherever it lands, good. I don't, I'm not poking around fishing too deep to get to here. So here you see our, our anesthesiologist. Um, he's actually using just a 5 8 five eighths uh, inch, um, I think 25 gauge needle, not a one and a quarter inch uh, retrobulbar Atkinson's needle. And we'll see how well it actually works. The trick is actually going more laterally than kind of inferiorly. And that he's, he said he's actually avoids a lot of blood vessels and better penetration. He's not poking around the globe. He's just going straight through parallel to the visual axis. And that does the job, especially if you use the um, uh, uh, Harardes. So watch carefully how this, um, our anesthesiologist does it um, and how short the needle really is. Once you push the globe back, you know, your needle is behind the equator of the globe. You can't hit the optic nerve. It's anatomically impossible to, to actually do that. His needle is not even all the way through. This is a five inch needle and half it's actually not in there. So it actually does not take much. And you see his needle right here. It's a short needle. You don't need to, those of you who are scared of doing retrobarbar, he only does peribarbar at all. And you'll see the same patient in the next slide, akinesia, didn't feel a thing, the entire surgery. So it's really possible to do that. Don't be scared of the block. I would not mess around trying a dystopical lidocaine gel or sedation. You can try that, but generally speaking, I, I've tried experimenting sometimes with that on some patients who I didn't want to do a block on because they had a, they were myopic or they had a scrub buckle and then it just did not work too well. So I really do recommend just using a peribulbar block. Retrobulbar, if you want to, that's fine, but don't feel compelled too much to actually dig around there if you have to. Um, the parameters, the settings here. So now we have the patient. And the one good thing I like, it's also very, very efficient. So those of us in, in my AC, um, when we do it, I mean, you can be doing your dictation, your notes, whatever you need to do on the screen, answering your phone calls. And then once they're ready for you, the settings are already on the machine here. And you just walk right in, no speculum, and you can just boom. So here you see me just walk in. I just walked in 10 times ago, gloves on, and we just start. So here you'll see in real time um, the treatment. So this is the viscous gel, gonia visc, and the foot plate here. He's a very, very uh, large lip fissure, so I'm physically just doing the procedure myself. If those of you who want to do it in the clinic, you do not have to have it done in the OR. We have a great OR, and the anesthesiology does the block, so it could be, and I'm in the OR like you know once or twice a week anyway. So it doesn't make a difference to me. You know, I'd rather just have them in the OR where it's all controlled. But if push comes to sub, then I can always do it um, in the clinic. If someone could not get to the OR because of COVID testing or medical clearance, then that's fine. So keep in watch um, the, the velocity of the movement. I'll zoom in on this in the next video, the next uh, slide over. This is a gentle moving session around it. Sorry, the exposure is bright. You'll see me change the exposure in this video in just a second here. And you see my settings on the screen, 50 seconds uh, per hemisphere at 2,000 watts. That's your standard setting in five sweeps of the action. And now I just do the inferior here. In terms of time, I'll just show the whole thing. While we're watching me do this, are there any other questions about so far? Um, we did have one question. Um, would like to know if we should be avoiding quadrants where um, a present express shunt, eye stent, or hydra is present. That's a good question. So there's, there's no data on that, but we can sort of make sense of how it looks like anecdotally. So express shunts, I would avoid. You never want to be messing with the blab or anything like that. So I'd avoid that small area of the express shunt. With the, um, one of the interesting factors of how Micropulse TLT works actually it's not purely just 
um, modulating the ciliary body and its aqueous production. And also there's some evidence that actually it's pulling on the longitudinal fibers, fibers of the ciliary uh, processes, of ciliary body, actually opening up um, anteriorly, or actually inferiorly and, and deeper, the um, Schlem's canal and the scleral spur, kind of like pilocarpine does. So in that case, if you have a stent in your TM, in your canal, surrounding areas should theoretically open up more, like this, so you have a hydrus. So you can do a hydrus for three o'clock hours, hydrus goes great. You don't need to worry about damaging the hydrus or actually um, causing PS formation at all. If anything, because the hydrus has stents the canal very nicely, um, you can just treat over it. That's fine. Remember, you're aiming under the hydrus. That thing's in the canal, you're aiming the story body. There is very little sort of overlap in there. Still, I would say just go for that. Um, it's that safe out there. Um, is it good to draw and mark the areas how many millimeters behind the limbus? I would say no, because so um, the 810 nanometers actually um, is absorbed um, uh, by melanin. Let me just play this video so we can talk, Dr. Shmi, while we're doing this thing here. If you use a marker, that marker, the ink, will actually absorb the energy. And now nothing gets deeper into the ciliary body. So avoid any kind of markers out there. You don't need a marker for this thing. That foot plate, you see the way it's designed, that yeah. foot plate sits on the, the scleral part of the cornea. Don't touch the clear. Avoid clear like what I'm doing here. Stay away from that clear area. And that's exactly okay. what you need to do. You don't have to mark anything. In fact, you can't because it'll, it'll ruin things. So here is the patient who is blind, pushing 40s with pain, and I did 2,500, the highest dose, bypasses um, each 50 seconds in each hemisphere. She did great. Her pressure, we saw her post up day one. Uh, pressure was uh, uh, under 20, uh, no drops. She forgot to use her drops. Um, post op regimen, I've, you know, back in the day, we tried doing it with like atropine, BID, and steroids for a whole month, and you know, Durazol. And now it's, like it's, it, it, it's even just generic Pred Forte QID for one week, no taper. I mean, it's the same regimen I use for an LPI. It's that comfortable. You don't need to use subconch DEX. I mean, you can do these things if you want to, you don't have to. If DEXAQ is covered, I put DEXAQ in the lid when I do these things, and that's enough. And then no drops. If they want drops, they can. Otherwise, that, uh, not DEXAQ, I apologize, um, uh, uh, DEXTENSA, DEXTENSA in the uh, lacrimal um, um, canaliculus is enough for the eyes. This is extremely uh, painless procedure, even post-op. I don't see any iritis or CME at all. And all, not just me, all the studies you see don't really show that for this thing at all. So um, yeah, again, point at your main point, Dr. Shmim, no need to mark. Um, the eye, but you can't definitely use a marker. You will absorb, the marker will absorb the energy, not the um, ciliary body.